One of the herbs that humans have treasured the most has fallen into obscurity since the year 1967. I'm talking about acorus, also known as sweet flag. This herb is used in Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, Unani, the ancient Greeks, European medicine, as well as by the Native Americans, where it was one of the most widely used herbs and one of their most treasured. This herb promises mental clarity, improved digestion, clears the throat, and improves the voice. It has a lot to offer, but at this time has become very hard to track down, and I want to go over what those issues are with it in this video. But first I want to go over the Native American uses of this herb. One of my favorite books on Native American herbalism is this one by Tismal Crow. And he goes over about 20 different herbs in this little book. And a lot of his descriptions of herbs has to do with the herbs themselves, how they grow in nature, and what they look like. This is the doctrine of signatures, and this is something that was also used in European herbalism. If you look at how the herb grows in nature and what its physical properties are in that environment, that will tell you something about how it can be used as medicine. So he goes on to say that calamus, which is what he calls acorus, grows in the swamp or bog in really smelly and sulfurous places, the coldest, dankest part of the swamp. So this herb is able to grow in that kind of a damp environment, a place where most plants won't do well. So there's something about the chemistry of this plant that it's able to convert those conditions and make them livable. So that's its signature, that it grows in these dank swamps. That tells you how the herb is used. This is a concept that is ancient. I wouldn't say it's universal, but it's used in a lot of different folk traditions. People learned about how to use the herb by looking at how it grows, how it is in nature. And so he says that it's for colds and congestions and breaks up phlegm and is good for the throat and voice. And those uses are really consistent with the uses in Chinese herbalism and Ayurveda. So as this text of Chinese herbalism says, Acorus transforms turbid dampness. Tismal Crow goes on to describe how it is used to improve the voice. And he says that at powwows, people would sit around the drum with this root hanging on a string around their neck. They would chew and suck on it throughout the day to keep their voices strong. This is consistent with how it was used in Ayurvedic medicine, in which system the herb is called vacha, which means voice. It's to strengthen and clarify the voice. Now, I first learned about this herb through a Chinese herbalist who talked about using it for phlegm also, but he was talking about phlegm of the mind for the most part. In Chinese herbalism, the concept of phlegm goes far beyond the phlegm you'd find in your nose or in your throat. It's something that can appear in any part of your body and it can affect your mind. Literally, what he was saying was it would be in your brain, which I don't know if that's possible exactly, but I think we all know what it's like when we feel cloudy or encumbered in some way mentally. This herb gets used to clear out the cloudiness from the use of drugs, in particular marijuana, where it was used in Ayurvedic medicine to counteract the after effects of cannabis. One of the things that's interesting about its use in Native American medicine is that it is now clear that the Native Americans brought it with them when they immigrated over to the Americas. You see, the Americanus variety of Acorus, the type which is now said to be indigenous to America, actually comes from Siberia, and it was carried over in seeds, presumably to be used as medicine. This would have been some 10 or 20,000 years ago. So if they were carrying it while they were traveling back then, clearly they must have valued it quite a bit. Acorus also has a history of being used in African-American traditional herbalism, which is a system of healing I've only recently learned about through this book by Michelle Lee called Working the Roots. This is an amazing book where this author traveled to the South to explore her family history and her husband's family history and document the uses of medicinal plants, many of which were probably taught to them by the Native Americans. So the acorus root gets used to treat colds and flus and bronchitis. It's an expectorant, eliminating phlegm, and also has an effective digestive aid, which is again completely consistent with the worldwide experience of Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, 
and Native American medicine. Michelle Lee also documents how Acris got used magically as well. It was used in love spells, for example, and to use it this way, it was burned like an incense. And that is probably something they picked up from the Native Americans. It is commonly used as a smudge like sage. People use it to create a positive vibe in the room. And there is some kind of a spiritual force that people talk about with this herb. And while she's recording it here as a, as a way to control situations or people, I've come to think that it's a way for people to exert control over themselves. And it is commonly used to treat addiction, especially um, addiction to tobacco. So if you burn this herb, it can heighten your state and influence you to make a change. And just as an aside, I think I should say that there is a lot of reports of people trying to use it as a hallucinogen. And there are reports of Native Americans using it as a hallucinogen. But it's not something that is going to make you trip. It's very mild. It's not that strong. It's an influence that you're probably going to only notice if you are meditating. So maybe it can heighten spiritual states and make a person more receptive to visions. And that's probably what people meant by calling it a hallucinogen. So with all of this tradition behind it, with its almost worldwide recognition as a powerful healing herb, why has it fallen into obscurity? And the answer is that in 1967, some research was published so showing that it could produce tumors and liver problems in rats. This led to an FDA ban on this herb, which exists to this day. So I want to go over what the evidence is for this problem. And I'll say right off the bat that I think that there can be a problem with this herb. So unfortunately, from what I've seen, a lot of the herbalists are saying that there is no problem with this, and they're misrepresenting what the research said. So just to be clear about the research, this was a study done where they took the European variety of Acris, created an essential oil of that plant, and then fed that to rats. And when they reached the dosage of 1% of their diet being this essential oil, it seemed to kill them. It created tumors in their intestines, and it created liver damage. So as far as I'm concerned, that is not something to be ignored. But the truth is, I'm a rather conservative herbalist. You know, I just like to use the herbs that I'm sure are really, really safe. I mean, I don't want to give someone an herb and say, well, there are studies saying that it can cause cancer, but no, I don't really believe it. It won't cause cancer. No, 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 no. I'd rather just choose herbs that are completely safe, and we don't have to worry about that at all. If there's a safe option, use that. And in this case, there is. You see, that study was done on the European variety. There's actually a few different varieties out there. There's the European, which came from South Asia. There's the Siberian, which then was spread to the Americas. And that is the one to use. That is the form that has almost no beta acerone in its essential oil and is given the highest safety rating according to the Botanical Safety Handbook. Now, the Botanical Safety Handbook is something I'd actually like to go into in another video. But in short, this is basically a professional guide to how to choose herbs safely. This manual sets a standard which is used by companies such as Herb Farm, Traditional Medicinals, and many, many other companies. And they spell out the issues pretty clearly. And the difference of type has to do with the ploidy, which, not to make this too complicated, but there's a chromosomal difference between different varieties. There's the diploid, which has two copies of chromosomes, and that's what would be the American and the Siberian version. These are the kind that can sexually reproduce, meaning you can grow them from seeds. And then there's the tetraploidy and quadruploidy. These are the types found in Europe, which the European settlers brought with them to the Americas, and presumably they did this because they were they were using it medicinally. So if you use the American variety, the kind that can grow from seed, it gets the highest level of safety, according to the Botanical Safety Handbook, meaning it can be used by pregnant women, it can be used during nursing, it can be used by children. In other words, it's right up there with peppermint and holy basil. It's a safe herb. So use the Americana variety. That's really the moral of the story here. And because of that 1967 ban, it is really difficult to find it. So I've included a few resources in the notes of this video. And I promise I don't have any ties to any of these companies. This is just what I've been able to find. And if you happen to have some land that has a swamp 
I definitely recommend getting the seeds and growing your own plants and then extracting that. That's what I would do, except I live in an apartment in the city, and I just don't think that they... But this is just one of those herbs that it's... uh, a little difficult to get. You know, we live in this age where we think we can just get anything on the internet, but this one's a little bit tough. You gotta know what you're going for, and you have to be able to trust people that you might be buying it from. But in conclusion, I'll just say I think it's worth it with this herb. This is a really important one. And if you're just starting out studying herbal medicine, I would suggest starting with this one. Test it out. See how it works. See if you can feel it in your own body. And also hear what other people have to say. I'll have some links in the notes of this as well with some other videos of some different herbalists talking about their perspective on it. And you'll see that there is a lot of an excitement and enthusiasm about this herb. And perhaps there has been throughout the entirety of human history.